Nicolas Cage is probably one of our generation's definitive actors. Hello and welcome to Cage Fighting. It's your main man Andy Gillard here. Hope everyone is keeping well right now. Hello everybody, Matt Guy here. Hope you are doing spectacularly and keeping hydrated. Aloha, hello everyone. Nothing else to say, it's just hot. <laughs> it's been a big old week this past week. We've had three of the biggest shows of the last five years all come to an end within like four days of each other. I mean, two of them ended on the same night one ended then the next show started and ended so we've lost barry succession and ted lasso all within the last week Stu, you're the only one on the podcast who watched succession i know myself and matt both have plans but we have plans for a lot of things and not enough of time so uh, <laughs> fill us in on succession was the ending good i know you've raved about the series generally but just uh, fill us in a little bit on this one please yeah, I mean the, the the fact that I'm the only one who's watched it, considering who it's made by and who it's written by, is beyond beyond odd. Um, but yeah, I've I've said to a lot of people about, especially with season four, because it kind of went under the radar a little bit before um, COVID struck. It was one of them buried on Sky Atlantic on a Monday night or whatever, ten o'clock. Um, but there's there's certain episodes where it gets to like. Breaking Bad, 10 out of 10 territory, where it's absolutely superb. Um, watching it back, I mean, you know, Andy, you know some of what happened because of the the absolute meltdown of Twitter that day um, <laughs> when that episode aired. I'm not going to mention which one it was. Um, but, yeah, it's in part towards, say, season three, towards the start of season four, is some of the best TV that's ever been. It just is. And... Mm. It has a nice end. Well, it ends very well. No, nothing about the show is nice because they're all terrible people. Every single one of them. Um, but it's satisfactory. And there's multiple ways it could have gone. Obviously, the, the premise of the show is the succession of the business and wherever. Mm -hmm. um, there's multiple people who that could have gone to. You could probably know. And, and I'll, be, I'll be intrigued to know knowing how it ended now, going back and watching it from the start again. Mm. Because I think it could be even, it could be one of them where it, it grows even more because there's certain things that are linked to like intertwined with each other throughout the years. And this is five years because of the COVID hit year as well. Yeah. Um, even though it's four seasons, but it wasn't affected by that. It's just, it, it's a masterpiece. It's, you try and sell it as, oh yeah, it's about, media conglomerates and like TV executives and it's it's not like they've got the glamour of Mad Men or that kind of stuff. It's all based now and mm -hmm. like the Fox News era and it all sounds a bit like boardroom and wanky, which it, it kind of is and that's the <laughs> point. Yeah. But you've got people like Brian Cox who's just being angry Brian Cox and it working perfectly. And when you got people coming out who – kind of swim in them circles and swim in them, them waters that say it's scarily accurate to what them kind of people are like. You don't get any better than that really, do you? And it's funny. It's 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 billed as a dark, dark comedy and it kind of is, but it, it's sad and you do, I am quite gutted that it's over, but in a way I'm glad because there's only so much of them people that you can take. Mm, yeah, but yeah, okay. su superb 10 out of 10 overall. Brilliant. I've just had a look, only 39 episodes, and like we've got to start and an end to it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's definitely on the list when I find a bit of time to, to watch it. Yeah, they are between an hour, an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. And because it's HBO Max or whatever, Max, whatever the stupid name it is now, it's it's however long that story needs to be. Yeah. And the best part, but one of the best parts of it, it, it doesn't treat you like a moron either. Like it doesn't say like previously on or like six months later, it just comes straight in. And like sometimes there's been like three weeks have happened, and you okay. just kind of oh well, it's a certain period of time has passed, and this is where we are now. 
There's no filler. It's just, oh, this is how we join it, join it now. Here you are. Figure it out for yourself. So it, it's the writing. I don't normally care about this stuff, but the writing on this is exceptional. Mm. Just is. Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, I'm the only one of the group who watched Barry, but I, I really think that both of you would also love Barry as well. It yeah. was it started in 2018, same as Succession, and had a year hit because of COVID, so we only got four seasons. Uh, Barry is played by Bill Hader, who is a former Marine who turns to become a hitman. He becomes quite disillusioned with that life and somehow finds himself in Henry Winkler's class for acting. Um, it's not Henry Winkler, he plays Jean, uh, Jean, Jean Cousineau, plays a character. But it's probably his best ever character. Obviously, the Fonz will always be his most known but this one really stretched Henry Winkler as an actor from everything from like the really sad depths of depression to height of a mania in it. Like he's really, really good in it, Henry Winkler. Didn't know he had it in him, I've got to be honest. Always thought he was just this bit of a ah oh, a good time guy who's just always there for the the yucks and the, the laughs and the giggles, but he's not. He he really got into the weeds of this and was fantastic. But it's very much based around Bill Hader. He's the creator. He directed it. He's been involved with it since day one. It is such a deeply, darkly comic show in parts. And in other parts, it's really sad and quite heartbreaking. And the ending, I think, will be very divisive because it it slightly retells the story, but from a different point of view in the last episode. And I think some people hate it and some people will love it. I was very much on the love side because it is very representative of what we're seeing in the world today. So I thought they stuck the landing perfectly. Really good show. I would recommend it to anybody. 32 episodes, you're looking at around 35 minutes a piece as well. So it's not a massive time commitment on that one, but it's worth the effort. Plus, the one guy who I really like in it, uh, Stu, you'll know him from, uh, he was Zaz in Gotham, uh, Anthony Carrigan, oh, who yeah. plays Noho Hank. He's excellent in it. He plays a, a, a Chechen gay, um, <laughs> not, uh, like mob boss, and he's kind of camp, but kind of cool, and a bit of a dick at the same time, and he's just wonderful in it. So, for his performance alone, I think he's well worth a watch. Uh, the other show that we lost this last week, well, we assume we're going to lose it because, well, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen with the future of Ted Lasso? But, Matt, talk to me about Ted. And what did you think of that finale? Yeah, uh, I enjoyed the finale. Um, it was bittersweet, I guess, in a way. Some of the bows that they tied to finish off some of these storylines was a slightly from left field i think um but the main crux you know the heart was there for, for the story i'm glad that they didn't one thing that ted lasso has done throughout the whole series really is never really clung on to a cliffhanger like something mm. will happen in a previous episode and then the first scene of the uh, like they don't drag it out they don't make a whole episode about the cliffhanger so much and, and that was kind of refreshing really but it did. It, I, I, I felt like it needed maybe an episode or two more just to flesh out some of the thing, some of the some of the endings there. It all was a bit not quite happily ever after, but just slightly rushed. And I don't know if that is time constraints, budget constraints, or whatever. But overall, as a series, you know, I really enjoyed it. It's got something for everyone. The absolute message to anybody listening to this that isn't into football is you you don't need to be into football to enjoy the human story of of Ted Lasso and and as the series have gone on, it's become less and less about him and more and more about the ensemble cast. Don't get me wrong, there was some there were some plot points in this series that were a little bit. I mean, there was no need for some of it, and it was very much kind of a commentary on social issues that are going on and things of that nature, like that were only ever discussed in one episode, which was strange. Um, but overall it was, it was a fantastic show and, you know, one that I think hopefully will get more and more viewers as time goes on. But, you know, it was very much a sleeper hit. I can't tell you 
spoke to people in the office about it a few uh, about a week ago, and it was probably like me and one other person in a, in a department of like 40, 50 that had seen it. So mm-hmm. I think I still think it's a bit of a sleeper hit, really. Um, maybe maybe people to just when you think of a football comedy or any kind of football related show, you know, you you start thinking of. I don't know, Renford Rejects or <laughs> or um, Corey fo- Footballers' Wives or something like that, like yeah. nothing of any actual substance. Um, so maybe that. But yeah, I mean, it was a great show. And um, the people that enjoy it, I think, you know, got a kick out of it. And that's that's the most important thing. Well, you didn't watch it from the start, start, did you? No, I watched it in between series one and two. So I watched it, watched series two as it happened, I think. Yeah. Yeah, because I know I think there was there was me and you, other Andy, that watched it from the start, like kind yeah. of reluctantly after watching the absolutely awful trailer for it, um, making mm-hmm. it look like the shittiest thing in the world, and then not, being nothing like that at all. And it, even then, like you're telling people, oh, this thing on this obscure streaming platform that you have to sign up for in a really annoying way to even get hold of, <laughs> or do it the other way. Um, which you even couldn't then, could you? You could. There was only the only way to get it was on Apple TV Plus, which it is was, the way yeah. you should you should get it, people. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think being stranded there hasn't. <laughs> I think maybe because we are in the in the kind of football world that we kind of we absorb it and we, you see all the discourse about it. But that's probably right in the in the in the rest of the normal <laughs> civilization of normal people who are not obsessed with this stuff all the time. It's still. <laughs> Yeah, I think it does go very much under the radar because of where it is. And you can't help but miss it because of all the publicity that they're getting, especially Hannah wanting them taking over the country, um, <laughs> <laughs> especially this year. Yeah. that Maybe that's drawing a few people in as well, but yeah. I had criticisms about this season. I, I didn't like a certain few episodes. It just it went a bit too far for me and it's too long, but... That episode made me actually cry. I was sitting there watching it on the tablet in the caravan um, at 10 o'clock <laughs> at night. And as soon as that song came on, as it does every single time that song comes on, and especially now as well, being the father to the son, uh, so to speak, it is, <laughs> there's something about it. And paired with that mon- that kind of, it's not sporty, that montage of events, it was just the perfect. Ending, the ending yeah, of the show. Yeah. yeah, the end of it, it was perfect. Absolutely perfect. And yeah, I hope we don't see anything else. I, I'll just leave it alone now. So, I know he said, oh yeah, let's, they could do some podcasts and stuff like that, but which is kind of fine. I suppose we'd all <laughs> listen to it anyway, but if they can just leave it alone, then leave it alone because it'll be perfect if they do. There's, there's only two things I want to see from from Ted Lasso. If it, if it has to happen, I want to be able to get my hands on Ted Crim's book and read it. Yeah, and I want there to be some. If it, if there absolutely has to be another series, it'd be something mad like Coach Beard marrying uh, managing Sampdoria or someone like that, <laughs> or like like a completely you know um, fish out of water story of him going and managing in Italy or, or any other like foreign league and just how he gets on completely away from anything Richmond related. Mm. Yeah, I, I think if they, they were to carry on, it would need to be that. I think it would have to be something completely, literally overseas and just away from, I think is the best way forward. But yeah, I, I echo both of your sentiments. I thought it was a, a great show. I really enjoyed the ending. I'm such a huge, big, uh, big Bill Lawrence fan obviously back from his days on Scrubs and he uh, shrinking, which he released earlier this year was an absolute smash as well. So I think I was always predestined to like this series. As you say, the trailer of early doors looked absolutely terrible and it was morbid curiosity is why I watched, but it was the actual quality of the show, which made me keep watching until the last minute. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was just great. And I hope they don't go down the route of doing podcasts and, a bit like how Will Ferrell has never let go of Ron Burgundy. Like, he'll always wheel him out to do something. Don't do yeah. that. Like, you've given us greatness. We're happy with it. Let's just move on. Um, speaking of moving on, I suppose we better move on and discuss <laughs> Joe from 2013, I think. Um, 
yeah, bit of an odd one, this one. Literally all I knew about this film was a few weeks ago when I read that Nick Cage put it in his top five films of his own career. Um, Stu, any, anything to this one before, or is this brand new as well? <laughs> it, it's brand new and impossible to find. <laughs> the fact that we have to go to the absolute backwaters of the internet to even get hold of this one. Um, and the thing is, uh, and you put it on a, on a sharing platform, and then which I downloaded from on my phone, stupidly enough. And then I tried to do it again, and it had already expired. So then I had to get it off my phone onto my laptop, to then put it off my laptop onto a stick, to then watch it through the telly. Look, is this going to be worthy? And, <laughs> well, find out. Yeah, Matt, this feels like it might have been your kind of thing. This type of film, I don't know. It, yeah, is it new to you? Did you know about this one, or is this? Literally, yeah, the only thing I know about this film is it appeared in a TikTok from about a week ago about that you shared or a couple of weeks ago with oh, yeah. Nick talking about his top five films. That's literally <laughs> the first I've heard of it. Um, the fact that it was easier to find Mighty Joe Young than this <laughs> says absolutely everything, really. Um, yeah. It was... Um, and you know what? I mean, we'll get into the weeds on it, but this is the kind of schlocky on Oscar nonsense that people love as well, so... I'm yeah. amazed it's so under the radar. Mm -hmm. There was a film 12 months prior to this film called Beast of the Southern Wilds, which is very similar, very similar setting. And um, when I was in this, I thought this is this is a better film than that. And that was nominated for Best Picture. Mm. So, I mean, I don't think this is Best Picture quality. I mean, we'll get into it. But the fact that nobody seems to have heard of it, apart from Cage Completionists, kind of is astounding. Um, so this film is directed by David Gordon Green. It's not a name that immediately sprang to mind, but when I've looked at his um, his actual directorial work, you'll probably know him from other things. So going way back, probably his biggest, his first biggish film would have been Pineapple Express mm -hmm. with Seth Rogen. Um, he then did The Sitter, um, obviously Joe, Eastbound and Down. He did a dozen episodes of that. Red Oaks, which was a comedy on Prime that I really enjoyed. Dickinson, which was a bit of a, a big hit a couple of three, four years back with Hayley Steinfeld. Mythic Quest, which is another great Apple TV show that not enough people see. And then he's gone on to do the Halloween, Halloween Kills and Halloween Ends trilogy. So looking at his list of films, when I saw that he directed this, I had absolutely no idea what to expect. Because his filmography just swings completely left to right without any real sense of identity. It's a bit of a strange one. And also the other name in this film who's probably best known would be Ty Sheridan. Um, he is known as Scott Summers, Cyclops in X-Men Apocalypse and Dark Phoenix. And was also per uh, Parcival in Ready Player One which is a film I really enjoyed until I read the book and then realised the film's not really that good. Um, so are there any real names attached to this film other than, obviously, Cage himself? Um, so, yeah, this film is described on IMDb as an ex-con who is the unlikeliest of role models, meets a 15-year-old boy and is faced with the choice of redemption or ruin. The film begins with a young man, Gary. He is telling his alcoholic father, Wade, that everything he does reflects poorly on his wife and his family. Wade hits Gary and walks away. As he is walking off, two men approach the father and start to beat him up. Then it cuts to Joe, a simple man living a simple life, just getting by. He helps some of the local down and outs, picking them up and taking them to do work, killing old trees which are to be replaced with stronger oak. One day whilst working, Gary stumbles upon Joe and his work group. After a chat, Gary asks about a job for himself and his father. Gary works the rest of that day. He works hard and earns his paycheck and the friendship of the rest of the team. Joe visits his friends at the local brothel, then drives to the local bodega and where he visits even more friends at their house. Uh, they have a deer hanging from its neck and they're trying to make some steaks. They're very much trying to establish that Joe is a friendly man whom everyone looks up to. He's a good man, a hard-working man. He's a respected man. 
As he leaves his friend's house, he is shot in the shoulder by Russell, a criminal with whom Joe has a long-standing feud. It's half an hour of the film, that is. Matt, what did you think at the beginning? Um, I mean, it set its stall very, very quickly, which I appreciated. I liked how they established very quickly that this is bum fuck middle of nowhere <laughs> hick. like as hick as it yeah. gets the law doesn't really have that much of an influence at least at first um and i enjoy, i was enjoying it you know it straight away you can tell that this is one of those films where nicholas cage has been given the brief that this character has soul and personality and everything else and then it's like the, the the dialogue between characters was good, and it it just set its stall very well. Um, you know, so we're a quarter of the way through; it's just shy of two hours, isn't it? This, mm-hmm. and I think it, it it did a good job of kind of putting all of the playing pieces on the board and letting you know what to tease, kind of what's to be expected. I think, yeah, it was a good, it was a strong start. Stu, what did you think? <laughs> I was. Kind of fascinated more than anything else. Just because we couldn't, didn't really know what to expect going into it. And then you, you saw a load of kind of hick black men getting out of the back of a beat up truck and with numbers on the back. I thought, oh no. <laughs> is, is, is this why he's, he's an ex con? Is, is he some kind of slave trader? What, what the hell is going on? And then you saw him like sharpening the knife and all that kind of stuff. And you had Gary sharpening his his spear or whatever he was doing. And you think, well, is he a younger version? What is going on here? And then (laughs) the thing with the stakes and when he was just, he was just hacking at it. You think, well, I've never made, never cut up an animal in my life, but even I know that that's not the best way to do it. (laughs) And I was just kind of, I didn't really know what to, because I thought, is it a piss take as well? Because surely people can't live this badly. And I mean, it looked like something from, it looked like something where like Katrina had left behind, um, mm. where, uh, well, this place is just like it is now, and we're not going to fix it. It's just shit, and everyone's either um, either on meth or pissed at their heads, and you see all the rickety bridges and everything, and, and it kind of reminded me there was like super, certain supernatural episodes that had like that kind of backdrop mm. of that kind of. Bible Belt America, where it's all gone to shit, and it. I was kind of fascinated, which I did, really didn't expect to be mm-hmm. at all in this film. Um, but yeah, I that was my overriding feeling at the time just fascination with it, and I couldn't take my eyes off it. I, mm-hmm. I don't know if I was enjoying it or not, but it was one of them that I I just wanted to carry on, and I, I didn't for one minute question, Well, where's my phone? Mm. Yeah, like, I agree. Um, it was something to do with the accents. I don't know if it's because the accent was slightly difficult to understand at first, and it took you a moment to get into the rhythm of the way they spoke, but I found it very enticing, like it drew me in. Mm. It was quite slow going, don't get me wrong. It, it, I'm not saying it was a long half an hour, but it was a slowly paced half an hour, shall we say. But at no point did I not want to continue with the film. I, I was interested. It got me invested quite early doors i thought i think that's it's something that like the accent wise i can't think of like a southern black accent like that that you see very often and especially mm. if you do it's like oh well they're criminals on like death row or whatever but not with such a big gang of friends like that just talking just opening just as friends do and it was hard to follow mm. yeah it was it, it was Almost mythical, which is a weird word to say, but it yeah, did have, yeah. there was that sort of cadence to the way they spoke that I thought was really interesting and, and really well done with it. Uh, whilst Russell is hiding his shotgun following shooting Joe, he comes across Gary. Russell tries to intimidate the youngster, but Gary, uh, Gary does not put up with it and attacks him. That night, a couple of friendly girls visit Joe. One of them, Connie, has come to Joe because her mum's boyfriend abuses her and Joe lets her stay with him. When Gary returns to work the following day, he's brought Wade with him, who is lazy, arrogant, argumentative and totally incompetent. His father has a negative impact on Gary. Needless to say, Joe fires them both. 
After the firing, Wade attacks Gary and takes his money. Later that night, Gary has walked to Joe's house in the pissing rain. Gary asks for his old job back. Joe takes pity on the kid. He offers him some fresh clean clothes and then buys him some food from the local bodega. Connie remarks to Joe that Gary has bruises. Joe says that his dad did it and that he saw him, but he can't get involved in every little thing in life. I really enjoyed Cage's monologue in the middle of this film. Like he's talking about how he sees himself as the opposite of that kid, that everything he does, he has to do to help other people. And he feels that he's a little bit beat down within his own life. But the kid has just been left behind by his family. He's, you know, one of a kind in this family of shit, basically. He's this really wide-eyed kid who just deserves better than he currently has. Like, Cage's delivery of the, the monologue there, I thought was really well done. I really liked that. I thought it was brilliant. The film takes something of an unexpected turn when we see Wade kill another man, stealing his booze. Uh, we knew that Wade was something of a scumbag, but I didn't expect to see him end up being like killing another man just for a bottle of whatever piss that he was drinking. It was wine, wasn't it? Because he commented on it. it well, yeah, um, it was. Some kind of rosé. <laughs> <laughs> like, imagine killing him, like, of all the drinks to kill for, <laughs> rosé. <laughs> yeah, terrible. Joe is sat in a bar and Russell arrives. He tries to offer Joe a truce. He asks Joe about Gary. Out of rage, Joe beats and then threatens to kill Russell. In his anger, Joe returns to the brothel. After being greeted with an angry dog, Joe returns to his home to get his pit bull, who then goes back to the brothel. And after finishing his business, Joe and his dog leave, leaving behind the carcass of the angry dog. On the way home, Joe gets arrested by the police. When he gets out of prison, Gary visits him, and Joe explains about the time he was sent to jail, how the idiot cop had actually shot himself, but he was given the blame for it. Gary and Joe go for a drive to find Joe's dog and have a drink together. They bond, and Joe tells Gary, if anyone messes with you, you tell me, and I'm going to fuck them up. Seemingly joking, but at the same time, you realise that there's a brotherhood there. Matt, how were you feeling about their relationship? Like they've gone from boss and employee to friend to father son, or, or at least brotherly. Would you say? Like, yeah. How are you feeling about it, Matt? I mean, it's very classic, isn't it? Like he sees a lot of the anger and everything in Gary, and he, you know, he he probably also sees himself as a father figure. But we know that he is an absent father anyway, which is really strange. Like maybe he feels a guilt, and maybe yeah. he feels. Uh, like a second chance at this kind of thing. Um, none of this is reinventing the wheel. Like we've seen this kind of thing before, but I think what they did really well was the transition between him being the guy that everybody knows that everybody likes and respects to him actually having this real dark side. Mm. They transitioned that really well. It wasn't like it, it, it felt natural and it felt like it, it was an escalation as opposed to, a complete 180 turnaround. Like it was, it was a slower build with it. Um, and I think patience is kind of the overriding theme of how this film went is that it, it, it was, it was slow going, but it wasn't at the expense of intrigue, I guess. Um, though I will say kind of with 20 minutes to go, I was like, how are they going to fucking wrap a bow on this? Like, <laughs> how is this going to end? Because there's still, it, it, I, you know, I hovered over and looked at us. Like, oh, there's, there's only 20 minutes left of this. This, this feels like it needs longer. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was, um, it still had me on the hook, which is the important thing. Yeah. Stu, how are you feeling about their relationship? Yeah. That bit where he, where he's holding onto him and, and kind of trying to tell him, no, you're not going to kill him. Um, even though he's perfectly capable of doing so after he showed on the bridge earlier on, mm-hmm. um, which we didn't mention, but yeah, I was, it, it's, a, it, it kind of hints at what? Why there's a few of where you can say if you enjoy this watch blah blah it will come to later, and um, because there's a few little thing few films and shows that are very similar kind of relationship wise, but I think because it is in such a terrible place and these are such terrible people that it kind of hits more because <laughs> Gary's gone through all this all this shit with this guy who's 
clearly a complete loser. I mean, you've got the bit where he's scavenging through the bins and the, the, the chef comes out the back door and gives him a plate of what looks like spaghetti bolognese or something. Mm. And you think you've got, really got no respect of you, that you'd rather just spend your money on drink and drink yourself to death um, than do anything whatsoever. And it's never kind of hinted how, how on earth they've managed to move there when they've got no money. Mm. But you think, well, have they just found a... a do they know someone who said that they've got an abandoned house? That is that why well, there's always someone there? And, and these are, they're just terrible people. And for him to have any kind of hope in his heart at, at all <laughs> after being built up like that, I think he sees it, he sees a bit like Matt said. He sees a bit of himself in him, um, which is nice and uh, strangely warm at the same time in a <laughs> film that's got hardly yeah. any of that at all. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree completely. Uh, after leaving Gary's home, Joe sees Wade whilst driving back. Joe threatens Wade. He tells him to stop beating his boy, and if he doesn't, he's going to knock what's left of his teeth out. Shortly after this, Russell and Wade meet up, seemingly becoming allies, bonding over their dislike of Gary. Joe once again gets pulled over by the police. This time he refuses to supply a breathalyzer test and drives off. After a chase, Joe and the cop fight. Joe beats the snot out of the cop and treats him like his little bitch. <laughs> By the time he arrives home, the sheriff is waiting for Joe. The sheriff tells Joe that he now has a little grandbaby that he wasn't aware of. The audience at this point, I don't think we knew about Joe's daughter, did we, until no. this point. How do you feel about this is the moment that we find out that little bit more of his backstory? Because they've really peeled back the layers on Joe very, very slowly. Like, I don't know, what about you? Because they make him to be this really good man, and then we find out he's in prison, then we find out that he's, um, I don't want to say deadbeat dad, because we don't know the the ramifications of how it came about, but that's kind of the implication. Matt, what do you think about the way that they've told his story? Yeah, I I feel like they're, they're making out like there is there is always good in bad circumstances as opposed to it's a facade that is this good person. Like we go through the bits of him, like the the girl he's with being like, Oh, should we go out? Should we do this? And there's a darkness to him and he's trying to, he's trying to be a better person and, and not be the person he was before. Um, yeah, that, 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 that bit though was, was a bit, uh, slightly strange. I don't know if it was more to, to get us, to feel more about their father son relationship as opposed to us mm-hmm. thinking about him in a negative light, but it was surprising. But and, and uh, but I think it's to kind of show you the parallels that mm, there are no angels in this part of the world or in this story, including mm-hmm. including our our hero of the piece. Yeah, yeah, good point, Stu. Did this revelation come a bit too late for you? What what did you think? I was actually quite shocked. Because you, 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 it's never because it, it's never hinted at until twenty minutes from the end, yeah. um, and you're always thinking, oh well, this is just a guy. He's not a natural father. He's not. This is not what he does. He doesn't take people under his wing, and, all that. and this is quite alien to him. And then you find out, oh, he's actually got a kid himself. And is it like, well, okay, now it makes sense. Now he's he's kind of is he making up for his his misdemeanors of the past? Is this why he doesn't see? Is it, his child because he's such a been such an arsehole and he's been inside. Mm. Is this like a redemption tale kind of thing? But uh, it's very rarely that this kind of thing happens where I, I was like, oh okay, that I just didn't see that coming any from anywhere. Mm. And I saw that the sheriff having, having a, a a grandkid because of his age, and that that one a surprise. But when when that revelation came out, I thought, oh okay, fair enough. But it sort of fits. And it, it yeah. wasn't, it didn't seem tacked on. It kind of <laughs> gave validity to everything that already happened to me. So I, I really, I really enjoyed it. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, that night, Gary visits Joe. His father has taken his truck. He wants to go and kill his dad. Joe tells him to stay here and be safe. Gary's uh, mom and sister will both need him. Gary then tells Joe that Russell has taken his sister. We see that Wade was actually pimping his daughter out to Russell and his henchman for $30 each. (laughs) Joe and Gary find Wade and Russell. 
pulling Russell off Gary's sister so that Gary can then escape with her to safety. Just as he's about to drive off, Wade sees Gary and asks him to take him with them. Gary ignores him and drives away. A shootout ensues. Joe gets hit in the lower stomach and then executes both Russell and his henchman. What I quite liked in this scene, I like that they didn't drag out the the shootout. Like mm. In most Hollywoodized films, that shootout would have been Cage gets shot a couple of times, he's cornered in a shed and he needs to fight his way out. And the final battle is him and Russell and he's got to shoot Russell a dozen times in order to win. But he didn't. Russell was just made off like a prick and he just shoots him dead and that's it, done. Mm. I really liked that it was unceremonious. Like He was almost unheroic the way he did it. It was just, mm. you're busy flapping your gums, I'm just going to kill you. I liked that. I thought that was really well done. At this point, Wade is now waiting on the bridge as Joe walks over. Joe is out of bullets, so he just nods to Wade, seemingly giving him instructions. Wade jumps to his death. Joe sits down. By the time that Gary and the sheriff return, Joe is taking his last breath. Some time passes and we see that Gary is driving Joe's new truck, playing with Joe's dog, and he's with his sister. Finding wood at work in the same woods that we started the film in, where once there was, he was helping clear the woods, he's now there to plant new trees. And that's the end. Um, what do you think of the ending of this film, Stu? Sad. <laughs> Again, like you just said about the Hollywood thing, you kind of expect it, oh, well, yeah, that... It opens up again, there's, like, there's trees, it's springtime, there's new life and all this stuff, and you kind of expect him sitting there with a, on like a, some kind of limp or something, or some something like that. But to actually kill him off, looking fair play. And it kind of, it works because the whole story is harsh and horrible, the place is terrible. No one really, no one really gets a good deal out of anything other than Gary. So, yeah, loved it. Absolutely loved it. Matt, did you think it was a good ending? I'm going to tell you what I did when I finished, and it, I, I don't, I don't have the words to describe it. I can only tell you the actions. I got up, I'm sat on the floor where I play my, where I play my computer games, like the man child I am. I got up, I walked to the kitchen, I made a coffee, I drank the coffee, and I just went, "Yep, that's just exactly what I wanted to see." It was just there was a real feeling of just not satisfaction like I've come out of a comedy and I've laughed loads or I've come up from a game and I've seen loads of action. It was just, it was a film that just ticked all the boxes for that genre and what I wanted to see from it. And it was just the right amount of level of, of, it wasn't really violent really, Mm -hmm. but it was, it was, it was, it was just really satisfying. It was a satisfying watch. It wasn't too hokey and Oscar Beatty, like I mentioned, you know, it, it it wasn't like a Coen Brothers kind of film mm. or it wasn't, you know, I, I just, I thought, yep, really enjoyed that. Now I'm going to do this fucking Simpsons jigsaw. Like it didn't stick with me <laughs> for like a huge amount of time. I, I, I didn't go like, whoa, man, I feel really spiritual after this or anything like that. But it just felt thoroughly enjoyable, the ending of it. And it, it, ticked, it ticked the boxes. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm completely in agreement with you. Like, you know with a lot of the Cage films we've watched, when they're over an hour 40, it's generally not a good sign. So when I saw this was like 30 seconds shy of two hours, I thought, oh, God, here we go. But actually, the two-hour runtime, they used every minute, and it was used very, very well. Mm-hmm. And it ended, and, yeah, I, I did have that sense of, oh, that was a good story, well told. I, I really... I've come out of that like that experience feeling better for having watched it. So yeah, I thought it was really well done. The budget on this one was only four million dollars. The box office return was only two point four million back, uh, which isn't a lot. But I've got to be honest; I don't remember this being released on the cinema screen in the UK. So yeah. whether or not it was a straight to stream, I don't know. I haven't been able to find that out in regards to like the rest of the world, but. It's like we said at the start of the episode, it's kind of surprising that nobody knows about this film, but 
that possibly why. At the Venice Film Festival, Ty Sheridan won the Best Young Actor Award. Director David Gordon Green won the Christopher D. Smithers Foundation Special Award. This is an honour bestowed upon an individual who makes a highly meritorious contribution in advancing the understanding of alcoholism. Mm -hmm. And Nicolas Cage also won another independent um, award for Best Global Actor in a Motion Picture. Um, it didn't make the Oscars, as we've already pointed out. The big winner that year was 12 Years a Slave for Best Picture. Best director okay. was Alfo Cuaron. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, Alfonso Cuaron for Gravity was Best Director. McConaughey's um, renaissance as an actor was also this year when he won Best Actor for Dallas Buyers Club. And unsurprisingly, Kate Blanchett won an Oscar for Blue Jasmine. Um Weirdest of all, though, Jared fucking Leto won an Oscar this year, somehow beating Jonah Hill for Wolf of Wall Street, which is just not correct. <laughs> um, right, scores on the doors. Matt, 8 of 100, 8 of 10. What do you think the audience and critics gave this one? Uh, I'd like to think around 7.5 to 8 at a minimum. I think maybe maybe 7.5 for audience, 8 to 8.25. Um, for, for, for critics, I'd like to think. Stu, what do you think? Yeah, it's It's got critic wang fest all over it. You'd think eight and above for this. Um, audience, I don't know because who's seen it? This is a problem. Mm, true. <laughs> and if it's only made half its money back at a pitiful <laughs> budget in the first place, then would people have liked it? But then... If so few people have watched it, I'll, I'll go. I'll go eight. I'll go eight for both, just because it's so. It sounds so niche, and so few people have watched it. Then they can't surely can't slag it off if they've somehow found it and then chose to watch it. Now I'll go eight for both. So the IMDb score is a six point eight. Um, and the Rotten Tomatoes audience score is a sixty eight percent. So they've got the same score there. The critical score was an eighty six percent. Which is yeah. kind of what I expected. I thought the the critics would probably enjoy this more because it's it's not an easy watch, I suppose you'd, you'd say for um for the, you know your filthy masses. Yep. Um. So the critical response: Tara Brady from the Irish Times, bearded redneck turns to out to be a good look for Cage, who puts in his best screen performance since Werner Herzog's Bad Lieutenant. Mark Kermode said, generally as raw as the stakes that Cage manfully cuts from the carcass of an impaled deer, the high whiff of which seeps through every frame of this film. Which it does because it all feels a little grotty, doesn't it? Like, I, I think you can feel that emanating from the screen. Um, and Charlotte O'Sullivan from The Evening Standard was slightly negative towards the scripting, saying with a bolder script, Joe could have been a Texan masterpiece to rank alongside Badlands. Um, a film this indie doesn't usually get like great, great reviews on IMDb, but this one has actually got a solid 4.5, uh, sorry, a solid 4 out of 5, with 72% giving it 4 or 5 star ratings. So I'm quite surprised at that, because we've seen better films get much worse on uh, Amazon. Um, Pen Name, though, gave this a one-star review, stating, the worst film I've ever seen Nicolas Cage in. Very disappointing. I mean, if this is the worst he's seen, he's obviously not halfway through a Cage career retrospective. <laughs> <laughs> uh, James Black also gave it a one-star review. Cage is getting very sad ever since he blew all his money on silly property deals. Check him out on Wiki. James Black then goes on to advertise himself in his review. Uh, James Black, private investigator, UK and international. Google me, <laughs> please. <laughs> so obviously I did Google him. Uh, JamesBlackEsquire.com. It's got a, James, a picture of James, airbrushed to fuck. He's got the dazzling filters out on his pictures. Oh, they wow. look ridiculous. Uh, there's also a contact page with a mobile number. So if you want to let James know what you think of this film, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but there we go. Um, good, bad, and crazy. Stu, start us off. I mean, they're, they're good. I just thought it was superb. I just... I mean, 
he kind of mixes with the bad. I mean, the bad is how fucking shocking this place is, <laughs> and that it's so true to life that you. you I've seen a few of them um, reviews about representing Texas as well, and how it shows what certain parts of it are like. And if these parts of it are actually like this, then no wonder that country's on its ass because <laughs> it's an absolute shambles. Um, and I think the bad part was probably because, like we, we mentioned earlier, it was a bit hard to understand to start with. Mm. But I'm guessing it, it's like um, someone from DC trying to understand a Geordie. So it's yeah, it's only the same kind of thing. It's not, nothing nothing bad. It's just well, you, you're not used to it. And it wasn't like as bad as oh, we had to turn subtitles on. It wasn't that bad. I mean, you, you, you understood every word. It was just you had to concentrate which is rare for, to have to be able to do that. But again, is that a good point? Because it's been authentic and it's keeping you engaged. So it's a mixture of the both. You can, you can, whichever, whichever flies you about, it's a good or a bad thing. Mm-hmm. And again, with the setting, it's a good or a bad thing. Performances were superb across the board. I thought <laughs> no one, no one was bad in this. Um, I think the probably the only bad thing I could probably think of is why would you have a catchphrase of I went through a windscreen and I don't give a fuck? Why would you have that as your catchphrase? <laughs> <laughs> he said, he must have said it three times. He did, yeah. It was weird. <laughs> <laughs> Just really odd. And uh, I mean it, the crazy, I I'm guessing it's gonna be yours as well, the fact that the dad was an actual homeless man and not an actor. <laughs> mm. Yeah, incredible. Just mental mm. stuff. Yeah. Matt, what are yours? So I think the good for me was that not only did you get the kind of plight of your main characters, I think they did a really good job of, you know, showing that there is a lot of downtrodden look for a lot of people in this movie, but everybody kind of got through it. Kind of maybe maybe um maybe how they're describing the human condition as being so resilient. Like all of the um all of the prostitutes, for example, um, you know, they were all well, what was bizarre? Well, I'll I'll come to that on my crazy, but um <laughs> basically they made it they didn't make it out that that you you supporting cast were just nameless, faceless people. I felt like almost everybody had some substance to them. Mm. Even like the sheriffs and everybody just had a little bit of time given to just give them something, just some kind of character, um, which you don't always get, you know, especially with a with a film that just has Nick Cage as your main star, yeah. generally speaking. It's usually his show and everybody else is just there to fill up the numbers. I didn't feel like that with this film. Um, the Bad, I, like, I thought Wade... It was Wade, wasn't it, the dad? I yeah. thought him killing himself wasn't in keeping with him as a character, though. Or I didn't think it just didn't feel like it was the right it was the right move. Like he wouldn't mm. have for someone who we've like you know, we were always knew he was a bit of a bastard, and then he just killed somebody cold blooded. Yeah. Like for him to kind of have a realization that he's a bastard and he and he should and he should just kill himself or guilt or whatever just it, that felt out really out of left field like I, I don't, it didn't mm. feel natural that everything else like the, the reactions of it, nearly every character felt real but that just didn't feel it just didn't feel right to me i don't know i, I just took that as oh well he's finally realized he's lost his whole family here mm. but now his daughter's gone as well he's got nothing else left that, that's where I got out of it, and it, 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 you are right though. It is. It is. It, I never really thought about it that bad, yeah. that much. That it is a bit out of character because he doesn't give a fuck and he's completely pissed all the time. Yeah, he's such maybe, a weasel, isn't he? You expect him to yeah. throw his way out of it, yeah. Maybe that, it, that that was another one of them. Oh well, everyone's got a little bit of good in him somewhere, and now he's realised he's got fuck all left. Then what's like, the point? Like, like if anything, like it, it, it's easier in my head if I think I don't know. It's in the case if he, it's easier if I think he was just trying to escape. Yeah, <laughs> he was just trying to get out, like as opposed to. But there you go. Um, the crazy is just how goddamn irresistible Nick Cage is to all women. Like, <laughs> like because they're not they're not making him out to be like a hunk. Um, and they talk about the, the fact that he's like coming on 
on 50 and stuff. So, but everybody, everybody just wants to be with him. But maybe it's because he is that man of the people and everybody understands that he looks after everybody else. So, so what if he has to get noshed off every now and then? You know, everybody mm. loves Nick Cage, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, right, I was going to start with my crazy because I, as Stu pointed out, my crazy was going to be that Gary Poulter, who played Wade, um, he was actually a homeless man. He's never acted before or since. And the reason that he never acted since is that he sadly passed away. Um, a couple of weeks after filming wrapped up on this movie, oh, wow. which is just a fucking terrible shame because I actually thought he was outstanding in this movie. Like, he was outstanding if he's got a career behind him, let alone if he's never done anything like this before. I think it's fantastic. Um, he won an award. He won the Special Honorary Award at the Austin Film Critic Association Awards for his outstanding performance. Um, just brilliant, that, I thought. Yeah, but like as you say, that that's my crazy. Um, the good is very much the fact. So David Gordon Green, he just takes local people onto his film, and I think you can see that with a lot of the people who worked for Nick Cage. So the mostly African American cast who were the you know his work colleagues, I think a lot of them. The reason they spoke like that wasn't that they were acting up to it. I think mm. they brought the authenticity because that's who they actually are. And it really added to it, even to like the cinematography and stuff within the film. I thought it was, it felt so true to life. Added on to the fact that you add the layers of the film starts off with them killing off the old trees to make way for the new. So it all starts off very brown and dingy and dirty and it ends in a green field and we've got the rebirth of Gary. So I thought like cinematography wise, it was really well done. Um, the director, like the other films that I've mentioned, that he's done this is very different to everything else like it looks like a very light touch was applied from the director almost like he gave them the scripts and just said well you know they're your characters you figure out who they are and i'm just going to film what you do i mean i could be wrong but that's very much the impression i got was that he let the actors act mm. and it worked fantastically well i thought um Finally, the acting outside of Nick Cage, I think, could be argued that it's probably one of the strongest ensemble performances we've ever seen in any of the Nick Cage films. Matt, as you pointed out earlier, the fact that even the sheriff who had a two minute sort of appearance on screen, we found out that he goes back way back with Cage. They have a history together. In any other film, if we'd have watched fucking Next or something... Do you think they would have given any of the walk-on characters that kind of time to, to show their history? Like, no. It, it was so well done. It, it was excellent. Um, the bad... I, I really struggle to think of anything I didn't like about this film. The only thing I, like negative I've got to say is the fact that this film has clearly got no airplay outside of the Cage Completionists. It's It's very bizarre that this has not got any sort of eyes on it. I've seen like much worse films get Oscar nominations and stuff. And this feels like the kind of film that especially critically would get mentioned a lot more than it does. And the fact that he took Nick Cage to mention it in an interview about his favorite films, I don't know, kind of speaks volumes about how this movie has been ignored and really shouldn't be. Uh, so did you enjoy the film and do you understand why Nick Cage put it in his top five, Stu? <laughs> yeah, and um, yeah. Um, this is... <clears throat> I, I kind of, unlike Matt, I did sit and think about it, because I watched it and it finished at 11 o'clock at night. So I, again, tried to find anything about it whatsoever to read about it and whatever. Um, not much out there. <laughs> And it's ridiculous because it's one of the best films he's been in. One of his best performances, easily. And I completely agree, and I could see why he says that, because it's obviously a passion project. He, even when he was doing these films for, for money, he wouldn't have made much money from a, an overall budget of $4 million. Um, yeah. um, This is obviously very much, again, as a reference to what it, it's similar to, um, with Pig, where 
he's just fucking class. And so is everyone else. And this is this is in top five for me as well. Already. It's one of the best films I've ever seen ever. I wow. loved it. I absolutely loved it from start to finish. And I hate this kind of shit. I, I any any Oscar bollocks automatic it's a it's an automatic red flag, so I'm not going to like this. But for some reason, I don't know why, but this grabbed me from the start to finish, and I loved it. Incredible. We'll be doing our top fives in a, a few weeks. Uh, Matt, did you enjoy it? Do you do you realise why Nicolas Cage loves it? Can you say why he's he holds it so highly? Yeah, yeah. I, I think anything where you know there's a real character driven story, he obviously really enjoys and. I think for him as well as an actor, it must be nice to to be able to get out of the shadow of a film of of his most popular films. You know what I mean? Like mm. it, sometimes actors just want to go on Broadway, or they wanted to be in the. You know, they, they want to act. They don't want yeah. it to be this huge, explosive, pun intended, affair and that kind of thing. And you know, this is this was that character-driven story that he really does like to sink his teeth into, and he, he did it. He did it excellently well. The only thing that I think that stops it so far in my head of him being like a top five cage performance is that the rest of the the rest of the cast mm. was so good as well. Like it was, mm. um, there wasn't really any bum notes from anybody really, anybody that mattered anyway. You know, in terms of like ad, like you know genuine delivery of lines and stuff. Um, it was an excellent film, yeah. Really enjoyed it, and it's just it's just a shame it's so in the weeds as it is. Really, I mean, I don't know how, you know, unless it's picked up in like a streaming platform as part of like a deal, like someone acqu- like Netflix acquires rights to a studio or something. No one's going to see it, are they? It's a shame. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a clean sweep. I I really enjoyed it. It feels like a perfect storm for Nick Cage. He gets to play a mentor, and I'm sure he probably was or is a kind of mentor to Ty Sheridan. Um, he'd only done like a couple of smaller roles at this point, so he then went on to break out a little bit. And I, I would imagine someone like Nick Cage would probably enjoy seeing someone he's worked with doing well, following on like from when they've worked together. Plus, you've got the you know the, the terrible story about um, Gary Poulter Wade sadly passing away that does add a level of um yeah you know, mythology to the film almost but it, it is all also like a very special movie with this really good little story underneath it all so i absolutely understand why nick cage has got it in his personal top five i'm not sure if i'm there yet with it i'll probably need to ever sit down and think and review the other films we've watched but like it's definitely like welling to the good of you know the Nick Cage films it's you know yeah really enjoyed it I thought it was a fantastic movie I think I know the answer to the next one as well but based on this film and this film alone was Nicolas Cage good or bad Matt yeah obviously obviously he was um I think what I what I really liked about this film um uh, it's going to be weird because they're not related in like plots at all, really. But this was the film like I wanted Mandy to be, in a mm. weird way. Like I wanted it to be like Hick Town. Mm. He's got to have his revenge. It's he's he's beaten down. Trolled. I wanted like if Mandy could be more like this, Mandy would be much better for it, and because of Nick Cage's performance in this as well. Mm. Yeah, Stu. Yeah, obviously. Um, I think. What Matt said, kind of weirdly right, though, because the usual thing of, oh, could it, you could re- replace Cage with anyone else? It would be hard, but, but for the reason that the quality is so high overall, and it, it's, it's odd because he doesn't stand out. Mm. And for him to not stand out for the reason that everyone is so good is very weird. And I, I can't think of any film off the top of my head that's like that where there's no bad performances. Even the dogs were good. <laughs> yeah, they were. They were excellent. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's another clean sweep. I thought he was excellent. Really good. The fact that he didn't stand out, I think, possibly helps the film. 
So it isn't one great performance which is lifting everybody else up. It's everybody lifting everybody up and it, it elevates the, the work that's there. So, yeah, I thought it was fantastic. Really well done. Um, as for Mandy, I think I'm going to need to rewatch it, you know. Like, I, I don't understand how so many people in the world seem to fucking love Mandy. Mm. And yet the three of us just haven't chimed with it. <laughs> I, I wonder if, like, it was just the time and a place thing or what. So I think I'm going to watch it again this Halloween, you know, just. Yeah, I was going to say that. Watch it, at, watch it at Halloween because then you're in the mood. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but for it, but for three of us all not to be in the in the mood at the exact same time. I mean, we ain't women on our periods living together. I mean, come on, <laughs> it's, it's, it's ain't like that. So it doesn't really make any sense why we all thought exactly the same thing. Mm, yeah, like the first time I saw it, like like twelve months prior, I didn't hate it. I didn't love it either, but I didn't hate it. So yeah, I, I need to give that one a go. That one's that could be my trapped in paradise, Stu. <laughs> <laughs> Every year. Yeah. Uh, right, finally, finish the sentence. If you enjoyed Joe, you might also like. Stu? Pig, obviously. Um, <laughs> the Road. Mm, as a... The, yeah. Yeah, comic McCarthy book adaptation. Um, and The Last of Us series or game. Of course. I, I never even clocked that one, but yeah. Yeah, very similar themes of uh, father son slash daughter relationships in a terrible setting. There you are, <laughs> Matt. Um, uh, it feels like the the rate at which I talk about Leon is really high on this. <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> to use Leon, um, but Taxi Driver. Basically, I mean, everybody should have already seen Taxi Driver, but if you haven't, you know there is very much the decadence of uh you know that setting compared to like the really down and out setting of this film but the themes are still there it's all gone to hell in a handbasket everybody's you know them everyone's moral standings are out of the window and there's a this odd story about a, an unlikely person that helps somebody that's down and out not down and out but you know what i mean i don't want to try to spoil it for anybody that hasn't seen it but it's it's got that air of weirdness, Taxi Driver. That if you did enjoy Mandy, and mm. you enjoyed this, it's a kind of a happy medium between the two. I think there's enough there that it's slightly odd, Taxi Driver, um, and Travis Bickle is that odd, oddball character. I think if you got a kick out of this, you'd, you'd enjoy Taxi Driver. If you haven't already seen it, or if you enjoyed this and you haven't seen Taxi Driver for a while, go see it, and I think you'll you'll enjoy it. Mm. Uh, Taxi Driver was on my list. Like as Stu said earlier, there's quite a few films that you could quite easily pick for this movie. Like there are semblances of Pig in there. Grand Isle also sprang to mind. I don't mm. know if that's just because Nick Cage is doing the same accent. Um, <laughs> Red Rock West as well, that also had that sort of noirish feeling to it, which this one does. Um, but the, the film I'd recommend, either A Room for Romeo Brass or Dead Man Shoes. They're both films. Oh, with, yeah, yeah. Um, Shane Meadows and Paddy Considine set in the East Mids. Uh, fantastic. I mean, they're very much about an older person, I mean, an older brother in Dead Man Shoes case trying to do right by a younger sibling. Um, a Room for Romeo Brass is kind of a darker twist on that, though. But such a great movie, great performances. Don't want to spoil anything about that either film, really, because what happens in them is just a fantastic, great story. So, yeah, I'd say Room for Romeo Brass or uh, Dead Man's Shoes would be my picks. Right, so that's another Nick Cage movie in the record books. If you've seen this one, get in contact at Cage Fighting Pod on the socials or cagefightingpod at gmail.com on the emails. Uh, this week, sadly, Matthew is leaving us to go and slum it in a caravan or a tent. I'm not sure what, what the plans are. Are you sleeping out? Take, take both, yeah. Take it. I'm taking the van, um, but we're putting the awning up as well. So um, it's the first festival in about 10 years or something. So Sam said to me earlier, she's like, you know, are we going to take all the stuff that we would take with us on a five day kind of trip, five night trip? So, you know, we're taking our electric oven with us, for example. 
um, and all of like the wardrobe and the drawers, like the the the, the, the camping stuff. And I was like, yeah, like why wouldn't we? It's it had, because we're paying to stay in this um, field that has like electric and stuff like that for for reasons. Um, I don't think it's going to be the the same kind of experience as I've had at other festivals where I've legitimately seen somebody poo in a bag and fling it around like David <laughs> and Goliath and throw it. Yeah. I don't think it's going to be like that. So I was like, yeah, why not? Why the fuck not? Um, mm. So yeah, I'm going to be uh, in a uh, in the field in the middle of Derbyshire, um, reliving my youth. Hmm. And considering you've already had offers of doggy, it definitely won't be uh, <laughs> exactly. won't be the the festival experience you're used to. <laughs> exactly. uh, but worry not, myself and Stu will be joined by Dave, and we'll be talking about the Spider Man. Um, I think we might just do Sam Raimi's Spider Man films. If you haven't seen. Across the Spider Verse by Thursday when we record you. I'm gonna watch it Tuesday. Yeah, I'm gonna watch it Tuesday. There you go. So we'll have a review for for Spider Man. I saw it Friday. It's really, really fucking great. Um, But anyway, we'll be discussing that next week. Um, Please make sure you subscribe on whatever podcast you listen to as well. And if you could leave a review, we would love you forever. Uh, Thank you for joining us this week and for this week, Matt. Would you like to say goodbye? Take it easy, everybody. Look after yourselves. Slap that suntan lotion on Baldies as well because it's going to be another <laughs> scorcher and uh, protect that little old head of yours. Goodbye. Stu, would you like to say goodbye? I've never been through a windshield. <laughs> goodbye. <laughs> it's goodbye from me and remember. Be excellent to each other. Oh.